listen to Roots Talk Radio every Monday at 5.30 on WEFT Community Radio. Coming up next is In the Know, a new public affairs show hosted by Sherry Williams. Um, after that, Champaign-Urbana Radio Theater will be on at 7, Monday night R&R at 8, live local music on WEFT sessions at 10, and recorded local music on Champaign Local 901 at 11. We're going to get to some brief underwriting, and then we're going to kick off a brand new show here on WEFT with Sherry Williamson. So uh, stay tuned. None of the mics are on. Okay. 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 All right, good evening, CU community. You're listening to WEFT 90.1. Welcome to In the Know, a public affairs show where social issues, trending topics, relevant research, and important perspectives are discussed so the listener can be in the know. This evening, we'll be having a candid discussion on racism, examining what racism truly looks like, what living with racism means, identifying local race issues, and what can be done to effectively address racism. Um, I'm going to have my guests introduce themselves. We have three amazing guests um, who have backgrounds regarding addressing different types of issues under the racial umbrella. Um, we'll start over here to our left. Uh, Sundiata Chachua. I um, teach in the Department of African American Studies and History at the University of Illinois, and I uh, write for the News Gazette. Um, Kyle Patterson, uh, and I uh, currently serve in the Champaign County Board and the Champaign County Mental Health Board. So my name is James Tinsley. I'm a undergrad student at the University of Illinois, majoring in political science, and also a county board member representing District 11. So we are going to jump right into this this issue. Um, you know, we had the incident in Charlottesville that happened recently, but we know that this has been something that we've seen in our society for a long time, and it seems like it's been escalating. Um, is that kind of the impression that you get that, um, I know I've had different um, people, friends, family who've said that it seemed like we realized there was maybe a foolish sense of security around the idea of race before the most recent presidential election. And since then, now we've seen that maybe we haven't made as many steps forward. What do you, what do you feel as far as like the work you see, the community that you're in right now, how do you feel we are with that? Um, I'll go first. Um, well, uh, um, one quote that always sticks out to me is one by uh, Will Smith who says, uh, racism isn't getting uh, worse, it's getting filmed. And so I, I you know, I, I really agree with that. And in today's era of technology, you know, a lot of times, you know, uh, there's a lot of things that, you know, get put right out there and it's for the whole world to see right then and there. So and it's, and it's immediate. And uh, in regards to, you know, uh, our new, you know, POTUS, uh, I just think um, it can be argued that you know, uh, some of his rhetoric and, 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 and you know, uh, promises within, you know, congressional, you know, uh, purposes can be enticing to some of, you know, extremists, you know, who might feel like now is the time uh, they've been given a green light. So, um, you know, I, I think, you know, now is just a situation to where, you know, with, with today's era, you know, uh, it's just, it's just why it's just very much more available for the you know, public to see. And, you know, it, it can't be hidden, you know, like, you know, like it may have been, you know, able to be several years ago. Yeah, I think in regards to that, we, you know, social media, I think, allows for a lot of the term keyboard, uh, keyboard cowboys who feel that protection, that anonymity um, of sitting behind their computer and being able to spot off whatever they want to say when it comes to a variety of different topics without really having to have that ownership or accountability. So I think social media can play into it, like what you were saying with your quote, there's a lot more, um, you know, movement with people expressing themselves. But I think because we're not connecting as organically as we used to, we're not having to have that accountability on a lot of different levels. What were you going to say, Kyle? Uh, I was going to, I, I think that um, kind of go what James was speaking to as far as um, uh, the reality that Donald Trump has really kind of opened a lot of people's eyes to the racism, but uh, 
white supremacy is not something that's new. It's not necessarily even something that comes in waves. It's something that's ever existing. It's just in sometimes different volumes. I mean, when you look at Donald Trump's most controversial things he ran on that were deemed as racist, building a wall is that's not something new. It's not that Donald Trump uh, came up with this. I think it's more of that uh, he says it more bluntly. He says what he means. You have Republicans who for many years have talked about, well, before we do reform, you know, we need to secure our border. And that's the term they use. And it's like dog whistle, it's code. Right. And, um, you know, you look at, uh, you know, he's not the first person to propose putting restrictions on Muslim countries. And he's not the first person to bring up the idea of, you know, uh, slowing immigration or targeting those types of groups. It's just that people said it politely. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the big difference there. Right. Yeah. Um, I want to disagree rather stringently with uh, both of my colleagues here. One, I think on the question of whether or not something is increasing, trending up, or trending down, or is flat, we've got to establish the time frame, right, in order to make that determination. The other thing is that, and I don't want to sound elitist, but Will Smith should never be used as a source talking about anything that involves an understanding of social reality. What I mean by that is simply, he doesn't read journals, he doesn't keep up with this issue. He's simply a celebrity and you don't know what the hell he's talking about. So let's start with an understanding of what racism is. I think in your, in your comments, James, you were largely responding to uh, terrorism use of physical violence. You're, you're speaking in terms of Charlottesville, the Charleston massacre. And that's certainly the most stark form that racism takes. But at the end of the day, racism is about institutions, social networks, and structural oppression. And in that sense, then I would suggest this. Let's use the standard understanding of what social indicators are. So we're looking at things that measure quality of life. That could be how long, longevity, right? How long you live. It can be housing, whether or not one owns a house, it can be incarceration, um, it can be healthcare. That we use those standard social indicators. One of the things that we find is that there's a tremendous leap in the improvement of the quality of life for African-American people as a consequence of the civil rights and black power movements. But that wave of, uh, we'll use the term progress for lack of another term, that wave of improvement uh, runs a Bakke decision that begins to roll back affirmative action. And then there's a, a, a real down period in the uh, 80s under Reagan, I mean a real down period. And there's a brief blip up uh, during the Clinton years in some social indicators. In others, there's a deep dive. Clinton, the Clintons are responsible for uh, mass incarceration, right? That neoliberal democratic agenda is as racist as anything the Republicans have ever uttered. Right? Now, then you see a downturn with the continuation of a, a downturn under Bush, and you begin to see some blip upwards in some things under Obama and a deep dive under, in some ways under Obama. So it becomes mixed. But at the end of the day, if we want to focus on terrorism, we got two forms, right? One form is private violence, meaning uh, regular citizens and residents who enact racist violence. So we are talking about someone like uh, Timothy McVeigh. We're talking about... Uh, dealing storm roof, right? But on the other hand, we also have the terrorism of the state, police violence. I think we can categorically say that there is a period, uh, the most recent period, has been an escalation in private racial violence. Certainly the Southern Poverty Law Center, and there's an institute at uh, California State Northridge that measures the numbers of white supremacists and hate organizations and their membership, they show a decided uptick from the beginning of Trump's campaign to now, a decided uptick. 
We also see a decided uptick in private racial violence in the two years that we've been inert with, uh, with Donald Trump and his brand of fascism. In terms of police violence, because of the mass resistance to it, we've actually seen a slight downturn in terms of the number of black people police killed. Now, just this uh, afternoon, my wife sent me uh, a newspaper article that appeared in the Black Online newspaper called The Root. And it's about an eight-year-old boy who is alleged to be, bi you know, they used the term biracial, and his classmates lynched him. He didn't die, but, uh, you know, he was able to pull the rope off, but they put him in a chair, put a noose around his neck, strung him up, kicked the chair out from under him, and he was fortunate enough that he was able to struggle and pull the rope off. Those kinds of blatant acts have increased under Donald Trump. What Donald Trump has done is he rolled the rock back from the cave, and these white supremacists and white nationalists have slithered forth and become part of mainstream America. They're no longer in the dark. That is a significant transformation. So, you know, we, I think we see even, you know, among the, the guests here that, you know, we have different outlooks on what racism is. And I think that's one of the, the ways, like you're talking about people being able to kind of slither around under different masks and trying to, you know, get away from the accountability. Do you think the definition of racism has changed within the last decade where people are either more trying to, you know, trivialize what true racism is, um, saying that, you know, this act that I did or this act that was done or whatever we see in the headlines, that's not really based on racism. That's a mis, you know, misconception or a miscommunication. Do you think that we're seeing, a, you know, racism being redefined? I mean, when you make reference to the idea of people downplaying things as not being racist, I think in a matter of a few years, we've gone from people saying that choosing not to hire black people is not racist or something like that. Mm -hmm. And now it's to the point of people saying, well, I mean, the Nazis aren't that bad. Mm -hmm. and, I, and so I think that that's a pretty dramatic change that, that we can't have an incident in Char Charlottesville and have everybody be united and saying that, you know, yeah, Nazis are bad. And um, I think that through Donald Trump, he has, as Sunyata referred to, as mainstream, that sort of mindset. Um, you know, this is not the first wave of Nazis, of fascists, of white supremacists. It, it comes in waves. Um, and this is certainly a high point, but in the past, there was never, it was never as close to an even divide as far as society goes of supporting or opposing those groups. It was pretty much universally like, okay, Nazis aren't good. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that we're at a new point. I think it's because uh, the wave that they're riding on is the president of the United States of America, somebody who was, you know, the nominee of a major party. And I think that he brought it in through this sort of mainstream way. And then these guys dressed like hipsters in their khakis and polos, you know, you know, new costume for the white supremacy sort of snuck in looking very normal, you know? Um, and so, yeah, in many ways, I think that we're seeing something that we weren't seeing a few years ago, even mm -hmm. um, in that, in that specific realm. You know, I, I don't think that racism, it has morphed, right? But I don't think that it's changed too substantively from previous years, meaning that it has always been a combination of structural oppression or institutional oppression and individual behavior. But what's changed dramatically is that since the end of civil rights and black power movements, the society came to construct racism as simply and predominantly individual acts. And the questions of institutions and structures have been ripped out of it. So unless it's Charleston massacre, unless it's Charlottesville, unless it's the attack on this eight-year-old boy attempt to lynch him, it's not seen as racism. And I think that was essentially the point that Cal was making. And what we have to do is uh, something that's very difficult in America because we train our youth to only think in terms of individuals and not to think in terms of groups when society is composed of groups and not to think in terms of institutions and the ways in which institutions affect groups of people. 
And so once we begin to look at institutional impact, and again, oftentimes it's not as dramatic, but the impact is certainly uh, more, uh, has greater uh, determination of whether or not people live and the quality of the life they live. And what we have to do is focus and keep people focused on institutions rather than just the extremely outrageous behavior of the white supremacists and the white nationalists. But we got to look at ordinary folks, white Americans, and how these institutions, how they run their institutions. Meaning that we have to understand racism as a series of rules, regulations, policies, and laws that produce disparate outcomes on the basis of race. So, you know, we've talked about, um, you know, the different influences that contribute to racism, and it's gone as far up the hill as, as the president of the United States, setting a, a dangerous precedence, I think. Um, a lot of people feel that it opened the gate to, um, you know, kind of this free-for-all in some ways of maybe practices that, like you were saying, were politely done, or people kind of coming under the guise of, well, it's not really racism, I just disagree with the way this works. Now it's just... I don't have to, you know, necessarily mince my words anymore. And so we know that the politics and our elected officials can definitely help or hurt the climate um, in society. What other systems, because we've, we've referenced systems now, what other systems do you feel are some of the bigger contributors to the racism that we see? Um, not even just nationally, but even locally in our own community. Well, I'd say, like, the first system off top would be the judicial system. Um, I mean, like here locally, you know, we have countless numbers of people who deal with issues of uh, recidivism, uh, backdrops of you know uh, criminal records and stuff like that. So when you when you deal with that type of uh, uh, scrutiny and, and, and shall I say mark on you, you know, it's just hard for you know it's hard for anybody to progress. And then when you put them back, you know, in most cases back in the same circumstances that they were in, you know, then. It, not, not only put them in the same circumstances that they're in, but nine out of, out of ten, maybe limiting limiting them to keep from leaving those areas, then it might then it's sometimes you know what I'm saying it, it just sets up you know uh, a system for failure, and uh, I, I really think you know that's that's one of the main contributors here locally, especially you know what I'm saying that that leads to you know a lot of crime in this area. Mm -hmm. so, would you like to comment on that? I can keep going. I, I do. Um, for me, the key question is what I'll call the marginalization of black labor. So we're talking about uh, the fact that African Americans and black people in the U.S. are always more than two times the marginalization of black labor that there are always uh, more than two times the number of the percentage of white people who are unemployed. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that sets the basis for everything else. Because what, what we end up with, once black people no longer play a central role in the economy, then the question is, what do you do with these people? In effect, African Americans have become superfluous. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, how do you deal with that large superfluous population? And one solution is mass racialized incarceration, right? The other solution is to let the schools, the public schools die. To make them, uh, you know, public schools were created to mitigate class differences and to create opportunity for everyone regardless of class, race, et cetera. Um, well, what we've seen since the Civil Rights and Black Power Movement and Black people's quote unquote integration into the public school situation has been the systematic defunding of public education. And so when you have something like the state of Illinois and now agree that those people who say we opt out of the common good, i.e. the public school system, and what we want to do, we want to put our kids in schools where they don't have to interact with blacks and Latinos, and we want the public to refund us for our racist decision. Okay, it's those kinds of things. And we can take every institution in this society and we can show the ways in which they operate in a deeply racist manner that reinforces, right? 
that reinforces a situation in which black people are degraded and thus we become open for all kinds of attacks uh, in which black people suffer you know and the, the disparate in uh, the disparate outcomes of every in, uh, social indicator in this society and it's that totality that makes me argue that the current moment is a new nadir, a new low for black people. You know, um, a lot of times you hear, I mean, I think this is probably an argument that's been around forever that, you know, it's not up to society to bring certain demographics out of poverty or to give them that quote unquote leg up, that they are supposed to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and, and take care of it, handle their business. You know, if you're in um, a situation where you're a single parent or even a two family home, you're living in poverty and as they are, you just happen to be of a certain race. It's up to you, it's your obligation to be able to take care of your family. However, you know, a lot of activists will say when there are basically obstacles, there are bars and limitations to being able to access the same resources as those who are in a higher demographic, um, you know, middle class, upper middle class. How do you respond to that when it's, it's, you know, again, I think we're looking at segregation in a lot of different ways when it comes to access to institutions. Um, you know, even financial institutions, you have different, you know, you know, buy-ins and things, like you said, with the education system. What's your response when people say, you know, just because you're black doesn't mean that affirmative action necessarily has to be the thing that comes in and sweeps you off and pushes you forward? Um, um I, I just say, um, it, you know, it's, it's easy to say that, you know, when, when you know, uh, arguably you might not necessarily have any systematic handicaps. Not saying that any, like most blacks don't, I'm not saying blacks do have any, you know, systematic handicaps, but I'm saying, you know, it's, it, it's the, the ratio of for, for blacks to have systematic, you know, uh, loopholes or obstacles in their progression is very much more, you know, say, uh, you know, higher. And when I say that, I mean, like, um, just going back to, you know, when you think of, you know, most lower income areas, you know, here locally, specifically, you have a dense black population where, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, uh, employment is scarce and, you know, there's a lot of idle time and, you know, uh, like I covered this, you know, that can lead to, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I had a circumstance. So with that being said, um, it's almost like, you, you how, do I, how do I want to say this? It's almost like kind of being like, uh, it's starting off behind, you know, it's starting off in the negative and, you know, Sometimes, you know, when you're actually in it, you, it doesn't feel like, you know, it feels like it's just a way of life, you know what I'm saying? Until, you know, you get to, you know, you're fortunate enough to get to a level where you might be in life and, and learn more about it. But until then, it just seems like it's just a way of life. So some people don't even understand that they're setback. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? They, they just think it's the, it's the norm, you know, until, you know, they, they realize that, you know, I mean, and, and I guess until they're enlightened and in, in, in knowing the difference. You know, uh, I, for one, you know, I, I didn't, I, I feel like, you know, for a long time, you know, I, I was very lost in, you know, where, where I thought my potential lied. And as I got older and, became, you know, was able to, you know, put myself around good people, you know what I'm saying, uh, I was able to learn more about not only my circumstances, but my peers' circumstances. Mm -hmm. and, and through that, you know, uh, I guess it just gave me the, you know, the will to progress. And, you know, some people don't have that opportunity. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I come from a family where, like, my grandfather had a third grade education. He didn't know how to give all my aunts and uncles, he didn't know how to show them how to do the homework. All he could really do was instill in them the, the will to get the homework. You know what I'm saying? And like, even now, you know, like, you know, as I got over with my mom, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, she, you know, had got her associates out of college, but she still worked three jobs. So she couldn't actually oversee me doing my homework. All she could really instill, instill in me was, you have to do this, you have to do this. And is is to me, like, that doesn't seem like much, but it seems like, you know, there's so many people who didn't even have that. You know what I'm saying so like I feel like for whatever reason you know what I'm saying those can those in themselves can be you know kind of setbacks you know what I'm saying that a lot of blacks don't have in our community you know what I'm saying you gotta you gotta think about it you know we live in an area where you know think about section eight you know what I'm saying it, it'll supply you know black woman's food housing insurance all she has to do is keep a black man out of the home you know what I'm saying and from that you know what I'm saying there are drawbacks you know what I'm saying that might not even be acknowledged until you know what I'm saying, later on down the road. Would somebody like to chime in on that? I mean, I just guess, 
try to keep it simple. I mean, you look at any measurement of success, um, economic, uh, you know, employment, education, you look at the disproportionate incarceration in policing, um, black Americans, particularly black men, I don't see, if, if you don't believe that the system is racist, then you believe that African Americans are inherently inferior. Simply put, because the numbers are there. When you look at drug use, just as I, I think even a larger portion of white people use drugs than black people. And then you look at the targeting and the prosecutions, you know, 60, 70 percent of the population of that by a group of people that make up less than 15 percent of the population. Right. And I think that the numbers are undeniable. So either society is systematically racist or you think blacks are inferior, which makes you racist. I had a discussion with somebody, um, I mean, this is a discussion we've had ongoing for a while, where um, we were talking about the war on drugs and, you know, drug addiction. And now that we have essentially the white soccer mom out in the suburbs mm -hmm. who now is addicted to opiates, now we have a drug problem versus when Tyrone was addicted right. to crack in the 80s, that wasn't an issue. And so exactly what you're saying, how we're looking at these institutions, how we're looking at these systems and how they apply to the different demographics, exactly what Kyle is saying, when it was somebody back in the 80s who was of color and had an addiction, well, that was part of their culture, that's just their problem, and you know, you need to figure out how to handle that. Versus now, wow, now we have this affecting a different demographic. We have, like I said, the white soccer mom who has an addiction now we need to figure out where we went wrong as a society so we can help her. And so I think, like you were saying, really, unless you've experienced any type of discrimination, you don't recognize what that looks like within these systems. You're not you're not seeing it. Not to, not to mention, I'm, just, I'm sorry, but go ahead. Yeah, I just want to raise the question about how we conceptualize these things. Mm -hmm. And I, I certainly uh, I really appreciate the way Cal phrased that, that at the end of the day, it really is, if you deny racial oppression, then the only alternative that would explain the conditions in which black people and brown people find themselves is their inferiority. Mm -hmm. But let, let's do this question of an obstacle. You know, I think of an obstacle as something that's in your path, but it's not active, right? That's an obstacle. Um, when I was a teenager, in high school, we played an all-white team. We had an all-black team. And uh, we were up by five points with five seconds to go. And we had the ball and lost the game. The referee wasn't an obstacle. The referee was actively cheating. American society is actively putting rules, regulations, policies, and allowing behavior to take place that systematically works against us. These things are not static, they're not neutral, they're actively working against us. So when people begin to talk these crazy things about pull yourself up from your bootstrap, uh, you know, there's two ways to respond, right? One way is to say, when the hell have white people pulled themselves up from their bootstrap, right? And what that means is this, White people don't want to talk about <clears throat> the Homestead Act, where they got free land. They don't want to talk about um, the policies of, of the New Deal, the Housing Act of 1948, that allowed them to move in the suburbs. You could only get loans if you moved into the suburbs, and by law, suburbs had to be homogeneous racially, right? They don't want to talk about the discrimination written into the GI Bill, right? Uh, they don't want to talk about every business in this society. Every major business has been funded by government. The railroad industry got uh, 800 million acres given to them out of public land. And that's just federal. We're not even talking about what the states gave them and every business, every corporation. When it comes to black people and brown people, and then all of a sudden, it's pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Well, I think one of the things you said when we're looking at obstacles and you're defining it, you know, active versus, you know, something that isn't active. Um, I think when you're talking about an active 
whatever you you know want to identify it as that also um, assumes accountability when something is active that means there's accountability on something that's act you know in in motion essentially are they pushing you forward are they pushing you backwards so I, I I like the way that you talked about you know this this active because I think for me when I think of that it's there's accountability somewhere because something isn't just in the way they just happen to be there. It's you're actively where you are. You're actively in motion in one direction or the other. And so I think that can be where it's tough. People don't want to believe that they are actively playing a part, even if they don't see it as direct, that they are in, in, in any way, shape or form actively contributing to segregation, to racism, to discrimination of any kind. Um, I wanted to read uh, something that you wrote for the News Gazette um, when you were talking about race and actual race. It said, the race relates an annual contest between two runners, one white and one black. The black runner has a ball and chain on his right ankle. The white runner has no encumbrances. As the black runner inevitably falls behind, the black audience becomes restless and loudly expresses their anger at the discriminatory rules. During the second lap, a small group of black people burst onto the track and, and with a hammer and chisel, break the chain on the runner's leg. Free from his restrictions, the black athlete mounts a heroic challenge and nearly catches the white runner at the finish line. Screaming unfair, crowds of blacks dispute the outcome. Initially, the judge reiterates the rules and reminds the audience that these rules have governed the race for centuries. They state chaining the black runner is a tradition. They remind the audience that over the years, at the urging of blacks, they have shortened the chain and reduced the ball's weight. However, given the size and disposition of the protest, some judges offer a compromise. They suggest free running the race immediately. Convinced of its fairness, a majority of the judges support the liberal proposal. And then it goes on to talk about, you know, now the, the black runner is injured. He has to deal with that as an encumbrance for being able to fairly compete. And so, you know, when we're talking about these different systems, I think that's where people feel like, well, we've given you concessions. What more do you want from us? We're giving you concessions where, um, for instance, one of the things I've not overly um, liked about um, local school districts, especially Unit 4, is when we had school of choice. We were trying to make things fair, when really what should have happened is people should have gone back to the drawing board and said, how do we make all of these schools have the exact same resources, exact same funding, right. versus, well, now people have this um, perspective or perception that this school is better, so now I'm going to have my child bust across the city to this school. It should be that the school in your neighborhood has the same chance, the same resources, the same funding as that school across town. That's, right. That's where I feel like the disservice went to. But again, we're looking at systems who are trying to band-aid what has been going on for ages. Um, and so, you know, when we look at these systems, how do we start addressing them in a way where we're not continually putting band-aids on things. We're not continually trying to say <coughs> we're doing what's politically correct. How do we move past what essentially I feel like makes people feel better about themselves and go into a place where we're doing what's right? It's a difficult question. But uh, you got two elected officials here. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I mean just to, just to keep it short and sweet. Um, uh, I think you know, um, for one, you know, uh, programs definitely need uh, municipal support. You know, uh, they, they need support from their governments, um, and from, and from there, you know, uh, but so long as you're building a relationship, you know, uh, from between the schools, the community, and the government, you know, what I'm saying like there should always be progression for education. And uh, I mean, it, 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 I don't think there's a you know a big answer for that. I think you know it's really cut and dry. You know, the I municipal mean, government should be supporting. You know, I, we should be prioritizing first. You know, education. You know, because I mean, <laughs> I don't want to sound cliche, but the children are the future. You know, so, so mm -hmm. <laughs> technically, <laughs> technically, you know, you know, in a nutshell. So yeah, like. Uh, well, and I think we find that that's the argument that comes back is, well, you didn't put enough emphasis in your family on education, and so your child has fallen behind. But have they fallen behind, or are we talking about access and public schools failing? I think, you know, um, that's that's a very difficult, you know, question to answer. You know, mm -hmm. um, I know from an elected official, you know, from my perspective, I believe that you know, with the, with the powers that be that, that might be at my disposal, you know, I should you know all elected officials should at least do the best of their ability to you know uh, allocate support all you know educational funding for children. 
I mean, you know, what, what, what's going on at the home, I mean, like, we all want what, you know, the, the best circumstances possible for our children. But from, from our end, you know, we need to do the best we can, you know, and, and mm-hmm. all, of, all of this question, those bridges can be crossed once, you know, we've, we've done our part. Um, I guess I'd say I don't necessarily agree with the premise that there is an inevitable point we'll reach to where people will stop being racist, where we can set up a system where we don't have systematic inequalities. Um, I think we can do better than we are right now. And I think that that's possible. I, I mean, to give a, uh, I guess a political anecdote, I had a colleague who was uh, going door to door, getting petition signatures to get on the ballots a few years ago, and some they're in some uh, you know more suburban type neighborhood, and somebody called the police on them. Uh, these are two white guys, and um, the police came and told them that what's going on. You know, it's not an issue, and and uh, the guy who was running, you know, kind of being a smart aleck, was like, "Hey, we, you guys could sign my petition," and the officer said, "Oh no, we we don't live in Champaign County. Yeah. We live in a small town, a county over." Mm-hmm. And when you have police forces where uh, the people don't live there, their kids don't go to school with the kids that they police. They don't, you know, if they kind of disrespect somebody or do something improper, they don't have to worry about, oh, I might be with my family at the grocery store and run into this person. And when your only interaction, when you live in a completely white county and a completely white town, your only interaction you have as a police officer is, through your job, usually specifically, especially if you're not getting out of your car and walking neighborhoods, and if you're just riding in the car, almost your exclusive interactions with African Americans are negative, right. because you know you show up and somebody's doing something they shouldn't be doing, and then that creates this, you know, uh, a stereotype in people's minds. And I do think that at any job, you begin to dehumanize the people you work with in a certain way. If you work at a restaurant or you know it just becomes part of the motion of work. And when you're talking about law enforcement, you're talking about people who are working with people who yeah. they're not around. I think that, you know, that, that that's just a small aspect, having things like residency requirements and trying to focus more on doing better in those little ways. I think, I think it's certainly big steps that we could take. Yeah. Now that, you know, we have the option of everybody getting to weigh in on, you know, articles that come up really on any online publication. Um, when, uh, one of the articles recently, I remember reading, and they were saying, if you have officers who are serving on different types of committees, boards, whatever it is for Champaign, they should live here. That if you have somebody serving on a board that represents any type of anything for this community, they should live in the community. Because otherwise, like Kyle was saying, if you have somebody who's removed from everything outside of their work hours, how do they have an appreciation for what that really looks like? You know, are they understanding that, you know, that beyond the interaction that they're even having with, with that individual, you know, are they understanding the community that that person is living in if they aren't living there themselves? So I definitely, you know, agree when you're looking at how to make progress and move forward, you have to be very specific about who your stakeholders are and how they're interacting. Because otherwise, if you have essentially a misrepresentation of somebody who's saying, oh, things aren't as bad as they are. Well, you live in Monticello. Right. You're not quite getting what's happening right here. And then not only that, I was going to say, like, um, I, like, I personally know, like, several police officers who live somewhere around 40 to 50 miles outside of Champaign County. So their, day, their day-to-day perspective of, you know, some of these lower economic areas in Champaign County is nothing more than a work zone. It's mm-hmm. nothing more than the, the, just their office, you know, their their you know, workspace. So, like, there's no, like, like Kyle was saying, there's no sense of community inclusion from both sides, you know, and, uh, that, I mean, that, that, you know, that, that can leave room for, you know, uh, untrust, you know, you know, from, I mean, it, it, it's quite evident. And, yeah, like, I mean, like, those are just one of the, you know, one of the many things we can, we can change, I mean, like, should be worked towards changing within the community. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know, one of the things that strikes me is that, the way in which we are educated in this society, whether it's through the formal system or through socialization, is to not think very logically. And so something as basic as wealth is inherited and poverty is inherited, that if you 
Look at the circumstances upon which African Americans entered into the U.S. as citizens. I'm not talking about slavery. I'm talking about after emancipation, we become citizens in uh, 1870, but we came out of slavery with nothing. Okay? So we entered a game of monopoly with no money. Right? And so it should not be shocking that only the lucky and those people who are exceptional are able to continue in the game. Uh, they landed on community, you know, wherever board it is. Or no, no, not boardwalk. No. You, you land on uh, boardwalk. No, you, 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 you yeah. They landed on that community square and they get that pool of money that's uh, in yeah. there, right? Um, and so over the course of generations, black people have been impoverished and pushed back. Uh, over the course of generations, white people who had something remained in the game. White people who had a lot, for the most part, went up. And to reject that fundamental question, right, that fundamental uh, reality leads us into a conversation where we can't go anywhere. The other piece, and this is where the Trump and the uh, the 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 real racist right wing, see what the uh, liberals, the neoliberal Democrats, Bill Clinton, that criminal, right, Barack Obama, those people, their solution to America's problem was to effectively present the darkening of America. So what they, so their thing is, we have to bring in skills from India, right, and Indians in the United States are considered Caucasians. We have to permit the, the, we have to further the immigration of Latinos because half of the, the Latinos who come in claim to be white and are white. They were white in their country and they function as a racial uh, oligarchy in their country. They behave, you know, white Guatemalans behave toward black Guatemalans the same way white Americans behave toward black Americans. So they're boostering that, that white class. Because they're, they're looking to maintain the skill there. Well, the Donald Trump said that their position is they they still got a little too much of foreignness for us. So we want a wall. We want to keep it out completely. So then the question is, well, how do you continue to develop a society when you've already made a determination that 17% and 13% y'all are giving no resources to, meaning the Latinos that are here and meaning African Americans and other black folk. So then how do you maintain an economy that is going to be competitive in this global market? And that's the problem that Donald Trump and them have, is that their position is, look, we're prepared to let this thing go all the way down because we don't want to bring in skills from outside because they're going to be a little bit too dark, regardless of how they're perceived racially by some white folk. And that's why, that's how you explain what's happening with the schools. That's why the disinvestment in the inner city. What society doesn't invest in their core cities? Only the United States. And why don't they invest? Because the cities are so heavily populated by African Americans and Mexican Americans and other people from Latin America. And so they're willing to let this shit crumble. That's the reality. Yeah, I mean, when you talk about, you know, decades ago when you talk about white flight, um, you know, to the suburbs, and, you know, that was something that was very obvious. Um, but, again, I think that comes to, well, this isn't, a, you know, a racist movement, you know, when you had white flight. This is just people handling their business, taking care of their families. So, again, you know, going back to what Kyle said, I think you were right about how are we viewing these systems and how these systems operate? Are Is there any level of racism that's going on? And, again, if you're not experiencing it, you may even understand what racism in that system looks like, but you don't necessarily know that you're seeing it when you are because you haven't experienced it yourself. You're going to say something. Yeah, let's say kind of something to think about is when we think about U.S. territories, a lot of them islands, Puerto Rico, uh, Guam, the Virgin mm -hmm. Islands, U.S. Samoa. Throughout history, what, you know, these are all places with brown people. And throughout history, 
only one of them did we ever turn into a state, and that was Hawaii. And that was after the state was memorialized by being attacked by the Japanese and starting World War II. Mm -hmm. Why is it that we never decided to, do we, we satisfied with an even 50 or, you know, why, why did we never take the steps to try to do the same thing for the other ones? And I just want people to reflect on that and think about it. Mm -hmm. So, so what are the questions, you know, that I think we saw more of this type of terminology and language used when we were looking at the LGBT community, you know, when we're talking about allies, those who are of you know different demographics but are trying to effectively, efficiently support minorities. I think there's a fine line there between somebody who comes in as a white ally, um, best intentions, trying to help, but then again, it's not necessarily um, oppression, but it is somebody who is making the movement on their own terms, in their own way, and now there's a dependency on that person to continue to be actively engaged versus being able to walk alongside it's some people have argued there's still people who are moving in front with that you know with people of color moving behind them do you see that do you think that that's an issue that you know how do you ask somebody to get involved but not so much so that now we have a new way of, of not necessarily pressing but not allowing equal con contribution from the people they're supposed to be act, um, advocating for you know well first of all the principle of an ally, you know, um, Jamil Alameen, the former H. Rep. Brown, put it very succinctly. If you are doing something to help me, then essentially you take your guidance from me. Um, I don't know that the problem today is uh, white leadership of, uh, of black social movements, of uh, black institutions, et cetera, et cetera. I do think that there is a problem with white liberals and white progressives that's critical. And it's that essentially it's what Andy Young said. You can't tell them anything. You know, they have a view um, and they're prepared to pursue their view and interpretation without consultation with the people who are oppressed. And therefore, uh, they constantly make things, if not worse for us, more difficult because we have to deal with how do we get them out of the way so we can handle our business. I've never seen it, but I've always hated the Sandra Bullock movie, The Blind Side. And it's this, white people love to say black people. And I guess we're at a better point that like white people actually care to an extent about saving black people, but we still have a lot of ways to go. Um, I mean, when you think about so many aspects of our society, you know, how many uh, TV dramas star black man? You know, how many Hollywood movies star black man? Besides Denzel Washington and Will Smith, who, who's out there. And uh, it's, so, so it, it's deeply, you know, we talk about education and law enforcement and, you know, these certain institutional things, but it's, it, it's, it's part of our culture. It's part of our entertainment. And I, and I think that the problem here is that, you know, we have this corporate driven market where they say, well, you know, uh, the majority of the viewers out there are white. So let's just only tell white people stories. Let's only humanize that. So we talk about that. And so, yeah, I, I, I think that there's a lot that we can do in that regard as far as what presentations are we putting out there? What are we glamorizing, you know? And, um, and I think just in general for white people, I think that you have to sort of warrant that you don't get it. That if something is said to you and it doesn't make sense and it might even make you feel defensive because you feel in some way you're indirectly being called racist so it's so natural to reject it, but you just have to accept that you don't get it and accept that the person who is of that group and is saying something is offensive is the definition of what makes something offensive or what <laughs> makes something wrong. Like I can't think of it any other way to explain what offensive means other than that offensive somebody. Mm -hmm. And so when a white person says something that's offensive towards black people is not offensive, it just it blows my mind. So 
I think that until people really start accepting that this is real, just because people aren't getting their crosses burned on their lawn, you know, focusing on the private acts or the acts of individuals that shock us, you know, I, it's a damn shame that it took, you know, a kid going into a church and shooting half a dozen, dozen or so black people for people to realize, oh my God, the Confederate flag is horrible. You know, I grew up with this idea of like, why do people have that? Why are we talking about that? Like, wh like, whoa, they could just do that. Mm -hmm. And in, you know, even around here, you know, you'd see people wear belt buckles or something like that, that w would go and question. It was never this idea of, wait a minute, that was a war waged on racism. Why, why are we, why are we not equating this to a swastika? And, you know, we don't focus on the big picture. I think that's part of it is just not getting it. So I think that's one of the challenges that we see, like you were saying, wealth is inherited, poverty is inherited, racism is inherited. Where are you learning it from? You're learning it from your family. You're learning it from your community. And you're essentially inheriting that because you're typically growing up the same place that your parents grew up. And even if you're removed, you're still influenced by your friends and your family. And so I think that's the challenge that when it comes to accountability or being able to recognize that any of your behavior could even be remotely interpreted as racist, I think it's very hard for people to see that because they have gone a long time with that behavior being unchecked because in their community, in their, however you want to call it, their bubble, that's not racist behavior. That's just how you are. Like having a Confederate flag, there's some patriotism around that, or there's, you know, another guys that it can be, you know, brushed under where I think that's another challenge that we have. You know, I've had parents who have reached out and said, "I worry my child isn't empathetic enough." You know, they're yeah. they're not they're they're not displaying behavior that you know makes me think they're going to be you know warm and fuzzy around yeah. most of the people around them. How do I change that? So when we try to look at at this, are we looking at you know encouraging people to expose themselves to different demographics, volunteering, getting in the field? I mean, at some point, they have to be able to have an experience of some type that should give them that appreciation that they're not going to have in their everyday life. It's just never going to cross their path because they're sitting in a place of privilege that will usually make it pretty difficult for them to have to, you know, for instance, how do I, you know, I don't have to worry about paying my rent or feeding my children, or I don't have the dream of being able to afford going back to school because I have three children and I'm a single parent. You, you know, you see what I'm saying? They're not having to have those different types of dilemmas going on in their life. You see, we, we have one central institution that's supposed to help us resolve that question. And it's not the family, it's not the local community, it's the educational system. And whatever people get in school, I, uh, excuse me, in the home life, I believe is trumped by what happens in the educational system. And so we have an educational system that is absolutely dedicated and committed to the maintenance of a racial hierarchy. Now, you take uh, the president of the University of Illinois. Uh, what is his name? Tim Kylene. Kylene's essential position is absolutely and totally racist. His defense of the First Amendment and this notion of free speech. Speech is free. Now, so when you say that you only respond to uh, hostile and hate speech with better speech, what they're essentially saying is this, from the context of the University of Illinois, that when these white fraternities and sororities decide to do their racial theme parties, black people and, uh, and, and Latino people, we are merely to, to hold a rally and condemn it and the university takes no action against them. They may in fact say that you need education, they may say that they, they should go to some sensitivity class, but they won't shut it down, right? They would defend it. Every time you hear a university administrator, whether it's the deeply, deeply, feminately anti-black racist Phyllis Wise, who, you know, praise everyone that she is gone. You know, she was absolute, absolute so anti-black that you could feel it when you were in her presence but well, kylie and them are a little more subtle a little more sophisticated but their position becomes the same so when it's about black people and brown people you can use racial slurs it's when they just want to condemn it as bad okay? but when it comes to something that they call cyber bullying 
that happens to white middle class kids, then suddenly we can legislate against that, right? Um, and, and that's the difference, that they're willing to always put another value above and privilege above the treatment or mistreatment of black folk. And until we're able to say, no, your notion of free speech does not trump the, uh, our right not to be assaulted verbally, insulted, and abused, right? Until that central point gets made across this country, we're going to be stuck with these racist monuments. You're going to be stuck with classrooms at the University of Illinois where white kids make racist statements and the teacher, the professor just moves on, right? Or puts pressure on the two or three black kids in there to respond. And when they do respond and the white kids respond to them, act like it's just a civil debate. Mm -hmm. Well, when you move to the racial slur, I have to say, I reserve the right to beat your ass. You, you understand what I'm saying? Because these racial slurs lead to creating a climate in which racism is normalized and the outcome of that climate is genocide against the American Indians, enslavement of black people, and genocide against Jews. That's the outcome of allowing that stuff to fester and saying something stupid like you respond to hate speech with more speech. Even the right wing Supreme Court said that if you burn a cross on somebody's lawn, that is illegal, right? In the civilized world, the United Kingdom and Germany, racial slurs are outlawed. No, you make a racial slur, you pay a fine, you go to, you, 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 you got jail time. We have to stop that. We have to make certain things illegal. That's my position. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the, the things that I would like to see, which is, you know, why this is the topic of the show tonight, is just to have conversation. I think we've moved away from having civilized conversation. Um, you know, people are going to come to the table, they're going to have different ideas of what, what racism is. But until you start having those conversations, we can all say what the reality is of racism in the country, but it, it varies from, you know, region to region, city to city, you know, what we see in Champaign versus maybe a town that's 40 miles away. I think what we need to do is be able to have this conversation in a very raw and candid way, because even if you disagree with somebody, that is still the reality of your society, what their opinion is. Two to one, they're not the only person who feels that way. So how do we begin to have these discussions where we can start moving to a place where we don't have to agree, you know, like, you know, Kyle was saying, I don't think we're ever going to cross the finish line, but move into a better, you know, healthier climate where the one place where our children should always feel safe is our schools. And so we need to be able to have discussions so that we can create climates, not just for the students, but for the teachers, because if they're, you know, trying to support, they want to be an ally in this, we need to be able to support them from administrators, from district administrators, and not just the education system, wherever we can have this situation where people are saying, we want to be able to step up, have our voice, not be stifled and say, we recognize racism happening in this company, in this system. We want to be able to address it, but not have it be one of those things where their concern is it's opening a floodgate, and now they have in turn become the minority because they're supporting a minority. So I, I think that's you know hopefully what we can do, um, you know, um, with, with different conversations that we have locally with things like the Champaign County uh, Racial Justice Task Force. You know, different groups who are kind of coming together to say we're going to start looking at what racism looks like in our in our backyard and how we can start addressing addressing those types of things um yeah definitely thank you guys for for coming on the show today i think this is the tip of the iceberg i think we need to continue to have this discussion this is definitely not the last one but hopefully the first of many conversations that we can have as well as the specific issues that also accompany you know racism um, one of the things i'm going to be talking about in a few shows is mental health and specifically how that system works with um, minority groups because i think that's a very important you know, situation we need to start looking at and how there's either access or there isn't access. So yeah, definitely thank you guys uh, for being on the show tonight. Um, and for our listeners and watchers on Facebook, you've just listened to In The Know on WEFT 90.1. Um, 
This evening's show will be archived on RadioFreeAmerica.com as well as my personal Facebook page. You can also find the video on Tumblr at In the Know 217. Um, next week, I'll have guests to discuss the TV series 13 Reasons Why. Um, guests will include Sheila Ferguson from Rose Crayon, Stacey McNichol from The Rock Group, Julie Karsten from Elliot Counseling. Um, We'll also have a lot of different shows that are going to be discussing some very hard-hitting topics. Um, again, we encourage listeners to, you know, tune in. Um, definitely.